Hi everybody, welcome to Vet Talks. My name's Dr. Sheridan Laith and I'm a volunteer wildlife and domestic animal veterinarian. I'm currently based in Panama, but my husband and I own a sailboat and we're planning to travel all over the world saving animals. If you want to know any more about me, you can visit my social media sites or website. So today I'm going to be talking about pain management in companion animals. Now the physiology of pain and its management is a really complex discipline and it could be studied for hours and hours with only grazing the surface of all the possible ways to better manage pain in our patients. So in this 20 minute lecture I hope to cover the basics of how pain occurs and the main pain relief options available to us as veterinarians. I'll also discuss how these can be applied to help your patients best. So first we need to know what pain is. So the International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that is associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So that's why pain is very subjective and what may be very painful for some is not so bad for others. So I think I prefer this definition. Pain is whatever the patient says it is because we can't truly really define pain because it's more of a feeling and an emotion. But what if your patients can't talk? This makes it even harder to truly assess our patients in the veterinary field because we can't ask them how they're feeling. This is why it's really important that we assume what we feel as pain would also be painful for them and observe our patients really closely for symptoms of pain. So pain needs to be managed because it has many physical and emotional side effects. This can include the slowing of healing, stress and depression, as well as affecting the pet client, client vet and vet pet relationship. Nobody wants to take their pet to a veterinarian who they think is not treating its pain properly. Pain also reduces the ability of animals to perform normal behaviours, which can then affect their quality of life. Chronic pain will lead to sensitisation and hyperalgesia as well, which essentially means what never used to be painful can all of a sudden feel really painful for the animal that's experiencing pain because all of those pain receptors are really sensitised already. The first step in understanding pain is understanding the pain pathway and how pain occurs. So the skin is innervated by sensory receptors called nociceptors, but many other areas of the body also contain these nociceptors, including bone, visceral organs and ligaments. These specialised receptors respond to stimulus that has the potential to cause pain, so this includes thermal, mechanical and chemical injury. If this stimulus causes the cells to reach their threshold, an action potential is generated which sends an electrical signal along the nerve to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. In the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, the nociceptors join with the spinal neurons in a synapse where the message is transferred to spinal neurons via neurotransmitters. This is really important to remember because these neurotransmitters can be targeted when formulating a pain relief plan. This message then ascends the spinal cord and is distributed to the brain where the emotional reaction to pain occurs. In the brain, the first signal passes to the thalamus. The thalamus then sorts out the information and conveys the signal onto different parts of the brain. Signals are sent to the somatosensory cortex, the frontal cortex which is in charge of thinking, and other areas of the limbic system such as the hippocampus. This then allows your body to decide what to do and how to feel about it. Obviously this really oversimplifies things because the brain is a really complex organ, but having a basic understanding of the pain pathway and what occurs in the brain can make it easier for us to come up with a targeted pain management plan. There are many ways to recognise pain in animals that can't speak to us, but we, it can be really subjective, so it's important to use a pain scale to make it more objective and quantifiable. You can make a pain scale for yourself in the clinic based on other scientific studies such as Helsinki pain scale for dogs and the Grimace scale used for rodents. So some things that you can look for when assessing for pain in your patient is changes in behaviour. So for example if a patient's refusing food or doesn't want to walk or perhaps they're cowering and trembling in the corner of the room which suggests they're either in fear or they're uncomfortable. You can also assess for changes in demeanour. So the really happy bouncy Labrador who came in a few hours ago for surgery, who is now just sitting really quietly looking very sad after surgery, might be in some pain. And obviously the clinical appearance of the animal will also help you recognise pain. So for example, if a cat is limping in the right forelimb, you can assume that that right forelimb has pain somewhere. Multimodal analgesia targets multiple points in the pain pathway, which offers more profound analgesia. 
So we can target pain in multiple areas, including the prevention of the detection of pain, preventing the transmission of the signal to the brain, and we can also alter the brain's reaction to pain. Now, in terms of when to give pain relief, in an ideal world, we would always give pain relief before the painful stimulus occurs. Now, obviously, that's not always possible. We also need to continue pain for, sorry, we also need to con continue pain relief during the painful stimulus. So for example, during surgery. It's also important to continue pain relief after the painful stimulus is removed because pain and inflammation will continue. Compare these two cases. One is a dog who presents after being hit by a car. You do an assessment and triage and you know this dog needs pain relief. Having an emergency pain relief plan can help you make a good decision quickly. So for example, it could be worth using an opioid for pain relief as not only will this provide analgesia, but it will also help sedate the dog slightly for an examination. Now let's assume this dog just has some bruising and no other serious injuries. We now need to formulate a long-term pain relief plan that should include anti-inflammatory medication and additional analgesics for their stay in hospital and at home. Now let's compare this case to a cat that presents with pyometra. Since this is a surgical candidate and we have a diagnosis before surgery goes, a goes ahead, we can actually come up with a preoperative, operative and postoperative pain relief plan, which means we can provide pain relief before the painful stimulus even occurs. The first medication I'm going to be talking about is opiates. Now, if we remember back to our pain pathway, we know that an electrical signal is sent from the source of pain up the neuron to the spinal cord. Once in the spinal cord, the neuron releases neurotransmitters from the presynaptic terminal to cross the junction between the cells and end at the postsynaptic terminal. These neurotransmitters are what stimulate the spinal cord neuron to continue the pain signal to the brain. Opiate medication binds the opiate receptors at the presynaptic terminal, which helps prevent the release of neurotransmitters. This then disrupts the pain signal. Although this is the main mechanism of action, Opiate receptors are found all over the body, and not only do they inhibit the release of neurotransmitters, but they also activate the pain inhibition pathways in the brain, and also have inhibitory effects on the postsynaptic nerves as well. So you can find out a lot more information on particular opiates by researching them further. Now opiates are all, not only great for pain control, but they're also good to use as pre-medications to help provide sedative effects before surgery. It's best to give them as soon as possible after a painful stimulus or even better before a painful stimulus occurs because once those little neurotransmitters are already being transmitted, it's more difficult to stop the pain. And just like any pain relief medication, they should be continued until the pain subsides. Next I'm going to be talking about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, otherwise known as NSAIDs. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories inhibit the COX-1 and 2, which inhibits the synthesis of prostaglandin. Prostaglandin has multiple effects, which includes inflammation and hyperalgesia. Prostaglandins also contribute to pyrexia or a fever. So the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories act in the peripheral nervous system, and they're best to be used before the noxious stimulus occurs, so that this little COX-1 and 2 pathway leading to prostaglandin and inflammation is already stopped. Side effects are related to their mechanism of action. So for example, one of the benefits of prostaglandins is that it regulates stomach acid secretion. So if, for example, we're using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and we're stopping the prostaglandin from regulating stomach acid, we can then, get, can then get gastric ulceration. Now, local anesthetics are the only analgesia that offers complete and total pain relief. This is because they block the sodium channels, which prevents the cells from ever reaching their action potential, so the pain signal is never actually transmitted at all. There are many ways to use nerve blocks, which includes targeting a specific nerve, targeting a specific area, or by simply splashing local anaesthetic into the abdomen or wound that you're working on. Lidocaine and bubivacaine are the most commonly used local anaesthetics in veterinary medicine at the moment, and also the most readily available. It is really great to use these medications in a 50-50 combo because you get the benefits of the early onset of action with lidocaine and the prolonged analgesia of the bubivacaine. 
I like to use local anesthetics for every surgical procedure possible, whether it's just a simple little splash block at the end of a procedure or whether it's more complicated such as targeting the specific nerves. Now I'm going to discuss gabapentin because it's a really great option if you're living in countries where pain relief such as opiates is restricted. So for example, I've just been living in China and opiate medication is not available for veterinarians in China. Now with gabapentin, we don't know exactly how it works, but it's thought to act at the synapse and inhibit neurotransmitters, but there's also some evidence that it acts in the central nervous system as well. Gabapentin is particularly good for chronic or neuropathic pain, but some new studies do advocate its use pre- and post-operatively in humans. So for example, one study in women who had hysterectomies showed that it reduced pain and nausea post-operatively. And like I already mentioned, it is more readily available in many countries where other pain relief options might be restricted, and it generally is fairly cost-effective as well. So let's discuss an example pain relief plan. This dog presents for a cruciate rupture repair. So before the surgery, it would be a good idea to look at giving a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory such as meloxicam so that we can prevent, prevent the COX pathways. And it's also a good idea to use an opiate in our pre-medication. So this will help prevent those neurotransmitters being released, but it'll also sedate the dog, which is really nice for a smooth anesthetic. Before the operation begins, we would also give a local nerve block to the stifle joint. So, so once again, just helping to prevent any pain being detected. In many orthopedic surgeries, we would also consider giving an opiate continuous rate in fruit infusion to ensure that the pain relief is supplied all the way through the surgery. When the dog's then recovering postoperatively, injectable non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and opiates should be continued for the first 24 to 48 hours. We can then cons consider switching to oral non-steroidals and opiates, or for example tremadol, so that the patient can be discharged and the pain relief can be continued easily at home by the owner. This is something I would really like to stress. It is extremely important to remember it's not all about medication. You can be giving as much pain relief as you like, but if your orthopedic patient is recovering in the backyard, in the rain, walking around on their recently fixed fracture, they will be experiencing pain. So it's important to provide comfort to your patient. So this can be in the form of bedding, warmth, and physical contact such as petting. Because as we already know, Pain is about the emotional response as well. So if you have a pet that's really used to getting attention and love at home who's then getting ignored in the cage, they're going to be getting really upset and really stressed, which will make them feel even more painful. So ensuring that they're getting some love and attention will really help patients. We also need to consider the movement of our patient. So whether they need a walking aid or how we need to restrain them or carry them after a surgery or procedure. And during surgery, it's really important to remember gentle tissue handling. If you're being very rough, the surgery will lead to more tissue damage and more pain. You also need to consider antibiotic therapy. So obviously not every surgery needs antibiotics, but if infection occurs after surgery, it's more likely to become painful because infection leads to inflammation. So let's go back to our cruciate repair case. We need to ensure our surgery is done gently and a good technique is used. And like I just mentioned, we should ensure post-operative infection is controlled because infection will lead to pain and more inflammation. We want them to recover on some soft bedding and with some warmth, so like a bear hugger, a heat mat, or just lots of blankets. Now we should also consider towel walking initially so that we can prevent weight bearing and reduce pain in the stifle. We would want this patient to be cage rested for some time because once again, they need to be restrained so that they don't re-injure the very delicate tissue that we've just repaired during our surgery. And we also should consider the long-term benefits of things like physiotherapy because encouraging a good range of motion in this joint will ultimately reduce the risk of arthritis, which will minimize long-term pain as well. So this was a really brief overview of a very complex discipline. I've included some additional readings that might be helpful in a clinical setting, if, which include how to assess your patient for pain, but also the current pain management guidelines for companion animals. I hope this lecture has really got you thinking about the power that you have as a veterinarian to provide pain relief to your patients and how important it is to do so. 
Thank you very much for listening. I hope you really enjoyed this Vet Talks. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or write them in the comments below and I'll get back to you if I can.